We are starting a new series today um, titled Reclaim the Table. And uh, if you look over to my right, uh, you, you see this, this beautiful table here. And this was donated to us by uh, Josh Canis through Iowa Barn Door and Mantle. And the wood used in this table is actually from Fort Des Moines. It's over 120 years old. Um, and it's a beautiful table. You can go up and look at it. Um, it's, it's valued at about, he said he, he would sell it between three and four thousand dollars in this table, but he wanted to donate it to the church. And, and uh, we are going to, at the end of this series, uh, auction that off, and all of the proceeds are going to go to Bethel um, Mission or Hope Ministries, which is Bethel Mission and, and Door of Faith. And they do so much good work in the community. They are, they are absolutely 100% reputable and, and um, incredible ministry that they do. And so with this series, Reclaim the Table, what we are encouraging and putting an emphasis on is we are challenging all of you to have a family dinner at least once a week. Now, for some of you, it's like, that's easy. We eat at home every night. Or others of you, your kids are, are going, they're on the fly, you're, you're picking up fast food, you're eating in the car, you're doing this, and it's just eating, boom, and gone. I've got schoolwork, I've got this. We want to reclaim the table and spend time sitting around the table as a family undistracted. And so uh, to help motivate you guys to do this, we're asking you that you would participate by taking a picture of you and your family at the table eating, and, and then you on social media post that with the hashtag NH table. Now, for those who don't know what a hashtag is, it's simply like creating an online folder where all of the photos that are tagged with NH table will then be put in one location on the internet where you click on that hashtag and you can see all of the different people in church that are having family meals. And so we want you to be a part of that. And every single week, we're asking you to post that picture. If you don't have social media and, and you're just like, I don't do that stuff, email the, the, the photo in or text it to one of the pastors and we'll get you in that drawing. And every week in the next four weeks, we're gonna be giving away a $100 gift card to High V for you and your family. This is a wonderful time, a wonderful series. We've got a lot of great things. Today, my dad, uh, my best friend, Pastor Weaver, he is going to uh, be kicking it off talking about reclaiming the table and the family table. So why don't you give him a warm welcome? Thank you, Austin. So put that hashtag back up there so if you, uh, you understand that you say something good about your church and then you followed up with that hashtag. And then anyone that searches on your search engine, hashtag NH table, all these pictures will come up, right? So that, I did not know this. I'm, how many of you old people like me did not know that's what hashtag was all about? Raise your hand. Wow, there's some old people that knew that. That's, I'm, I'm more impressed and a little depressed that I didn't, uh, but nonetheless, it, it is what it is. But today we start this series before weeks, and Pastor Austin uh, is saying one, I, w I want you to commit to at least one family meal together, but I, I want, I, I'm going to challenge you to do three. I'm going to challenge you to do three. So I want, you to, I want you to listen to my message, and I want you to think about it as we begin this Reclaiming the Table uh, series. Today's topic is family table. Later we'll have um, uh, a table for neighbors. Uh, a table for uh, mercy, a table, the Lord's table. We'll have a uh, Thanksgiving table. So we'll be talking about all these things. But I'm going to tell you, when you see this table over here and you come look at it, how beautiful it is, okay, I want you to be reminded every time you walk in here how important to Jesus a table was. It's not in my sermon, but if you go to Leviticus where it describes the, the, the building of the uh, of, of a table there, it describes exactly the width and what we use it, what you probably, your table is in your living room, or in your dining room rather. Ours is kind of in our living room area, kind of a big, great room. But, you know, God knew what he's talking about when he, when he said there's a place at the table, and he invites us to that table, and as families, we need to reclaim that table, and I sure hope you'll hear this with all of my heart, please hear it. So, um, you know, I think we've really lost something that's not only biblical, but in my experience is also historical as I grew up, and that's eating together and talking around the table. When your kids are there, 
no matter who they are, let them talk as they eat. Don't teach them. Don't talk while you're chewing because the conversation that's happening there needs to happen. Now, you can explain to them in public to be careful with that. But at home, the talking is more important than the eating. So interact, interact and be intentional about it. Hey, I wanted to mention before we turn, if you would, De Deuteronomy 6, if you turn there, I wanted to mention that once a month we have these new pages that we have because sometimes the magazine doesn't have all the details and this is some details of announcements. It's a monthly and on the back you'll see the monthly calendar. They're at the Welcome Center. They'll be handing them out the first Sunday of each month or at the end of the month before or something like that. I'm not even sure. I just work here, okay? So, yeah, it's the truth. Pastor Jeff runs the church. Staff meeting, Pastor Brian, you're in charge tomorrow. I can't be there. I've got other things. Are you, did you know that? Did you know I'm... You're going out to eat? We're going to go to the table, okay? Uh, all right, well, why don't you just eat around the meeting room table and like do some business there for the Lord. So, uh, anyway... Uh, so we're going to read this Deuteronomy 6, uh, and, uh, and then I'm going to show you a video that describes uh, this passage. So when, when, when you see the video, picture the whole chapter as part of, of this. And I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but the emphasis in this passage is so powerful, and we failed it. Listen to me. Here's why we failed it as a church. Because years ago, we had a great idea called Sunday School. And we, it, we promoted Sunday School because it is important. Graded education for children and education of teaching the Bible verse by verse to adults going through the Bible. Because right now uh, in America, the Christian church is biblically illiterate. And I believe in Sunday School. I'm not putting it down. But the un unintended consequence is that the families abdicated their responsibility to win their own children and disciple their own children to the church. And it won't work. It cannot work. It's only a supplement. Christian school is a supplement. It's not the answer. Mom and dad are number one, and you are responsible to build that relationship, win your children, and disciple them, and grow them to be strong. So... Uh, let's take a look at this passage to read chapter 6, starting with verse 1. And I'm reading off the screen because my NIV is a little different. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, that you your children, and their children. The one version, the NASB says, your sons and your grandsons. And the reason it mentions the male side there is because the patriarch society and the fact that men uh, are, 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 are responsible for, it doesn't make them higher than or better than, but they have the primary responsibility to, God's going to hold them accountable for leading their family spiritually. It's not about being in charge. It's not about talking down. It's not about it's not about uh, putting your woman in their place. That's all absolute, the most heathen perspective. That's what heathen religions do. They oppress women. Jesus said, the Word of God says, that in Christianity, the gospel, it makes, there's no male or female, no Greek or Jew, and no slave or free man. It's we're all before God looked at upon the same as we interact. And so here we see that his decrees is to the children and to their children after them that they may fear the Lord your God. To fear God is to take God seriously. We're not that serious about the commands of God. When God says something, do we believe that he meant it? Now, we actually, in our culture, uh, Christ, uh, unsaved Christians, unsaved Christians all over America, we, we have elevated our own opinion above the biblical word where I don't, well, I don't think that's right, or well, I don't agree with that. Okay, then throw out the Jesus love and grace and the cross. Don't agree with that either. You're not going to agree with all of it. Don't agree with any of it. You're on your own. Notice it, to fear the Lord your God. I want you to really see that word fear, fear God. Not being afraid of, but respect and honor and taking him seriously. As long as you live by keeping all, notice the word all, his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy a long life. Hear, Israel, 
and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with your God with all of your heart. And actually, the, the, the real word there is from, not with, but from your heart. As God puts his love in your heart, from your heart, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts, Impress them on your children. Impress, impress, impress. Think of the word. On your children, talk about them when you sit at home. You're sitting at home, mealtime. When you walk along the road or in your car, drive time. When you lie down at bedtime and when you get up first thing in the morning. Impress them. Tie them as symbols. In other words, be obvious on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Our Jewish brothers took that serious and they, they, they would wear boxes with the law, with this right here, wrapped up and rolled up in it so that they would never forget how important, don't forget it, impress it, live it out. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Be sure to keep the commands of the Lord your God and the stipulations and decrees that he has given you. And then it says, the Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees, to fear the Lord our God, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive, as is the case today. So we read verses 1 to 9, and then we read verse 17 and verse 24 that emphasize to obey, to follow, to serve. With that in mind, this video is about this passage. Please watch it. And uh, I don't know if we can live stream it or not. I think we can because it's on the internet anyway. But if we can't, I, will, I can post it on New Hope Facebook members page and you can review it to look at it again. Let's roll it. Shema, to listen and obey. Shema, to listen and obey. So I want you to take seriously the commands of the Lord that we as parents and grandparents reclaim the table and disciple our families and disciple them in a way to show them the seriousness of following after God. So they would quote this, the ancient Hebrews, the Jews, at least twice a day. They would quote it multiple times because it was so important. And I want you to get this passage and mark it down, Deuteronomy 6. So we're going to, as a church, reclaim the table because I believe the time around that table God has given to us and, and, and God has given it to us is because it's important. Time around the table for discipleship and for healthier living, for remembering how good God is and, and has been to us. And, and there's a time to be thankful around that table. So for the next four weeks, we're going to look at the meals, look at meals and eating and spending time together. So the first point today is the importance. Why? You say, is it important to reclaim the table? It is. The Bible actually starts pretty soon after creation talking about eating. Did you know that? God talks about eating. He says, I created all of this for you. You can eat anything you want, Adam and Eve, except that one. You can eat anything. It is all really good except that one. And how many you know that Adam and Eve went right for the except that one? <laughs> and ever since, we've pretty much been uh, making bad food choices. But, <laughs> but, but the Bible talks about eating a lot. It opens up with eating. And then it actually talks about eating meals in the Old Testament. The Jewish people, for instance, uh, they have meals that celebrate and help them understand God and their theology. And uh, like the Passover meal, it's all teaching. And the simplest thing for us in that reference is the the, the, the table of mercy, the, 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 the uh, Lord's table, the communion. We hold the bread and we look at the cup and we remember Jesus, that he died on the cross and shed his blood for us. What a thankful thing. And November 17, that's the table, the Lord's table that we'll be talking about. But today we're looking at family table. See, Jesus did so much of his ministry at meals. Did you know that? In the Gospel of Luke, for instance, we see Jesus either coming from a meal, going to a meal, or at a meal always eating. 
I like breakfast food, and I like people. I like to eat breakfast with people. I mean, you know that true about me. If you're new and you haven't eaten breakfast with me, my business card's there with my cell number and my personal email. I want to get to know you. I want to interact with you, and I love breakfast. So let's meet and let's get to know. Let's talk. So, so yeah, Jesus, he, he loved to eat, and he did it a lot. And, and I don't mean he loved to eat like in that respect, but because of what happens at the table. And so um, uh, in the Gospel of Luke, we see that Jesus is, like I said, coming from a meal, et cetera. So here's what we're going to do. In December, starting December 1, we're going to read a chapter in the book of Luke each day. There are 24 chapters of Luke. So December 1 through December 24, by the time we've read the book of Luke, when we hit Christmas, we're going to have a lot clearer understanding of all of that and of what Christmas is all about and of Jesus and all of that. And in the light of this series in November about the importance of the table, all of a sudden in Luke, your eyes are going to be open and you're going to see something. You know that Getting back to uh, the food, do you know that the Bible ends with eating? In Revelation 19, 9, it says, Then the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. The Lamb's supper. The Lamb, that's, that's Jesus. You know, like lambs were offered as sacrifice for sin in the Old Testament. No more do we kill animals. We don't shed the blood of it. Jesus died once for all for all of us. He shed his blood. And he's our sin sacrifice and the Lamb of God. Think about that. God, think about this banquet we're going to do, the supper of the Lamb. God, after all of the end time events described in the Bible and all the things that have gone on, suddenly the first thing we're going to do when all of that's over when those events take place, we're going to, he's going to give us an all-you-can-eat buffet with no calories. You know, maybe why some of you love buffets is you're close to God and it like, feels like heaven to you. But I will warn you that there are calories in buffets. For those of you that are on that ship, remember that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Just think about it seriously, though. I mean, there must be a God. I mean, he invented bacon. It's awesome. <laughs> Just go to Israel some time. The first thing you want to do is stop it somewhere and get a bacon cheeseburger because you can't have cheese and meat together and you cannot have bacon because it's pork. But the Lord, yeah, it's okay. Don't, don't get upset with me there. So but listen, so here, here's what we're talking about. We're designed to gather around tables and to eat and share life together around tables and to win and disciple our families. And a big part of this happens at mealtime. So mealtime, again, as we read the scripture about showing the word and teaching them to obey and telling the stories, it's all, as the scripture says, it says in verse, I believe it's seven, as you sit at home. Well, what are they? They're sitting at home. They're around the table. It's mealtime. De Jesus did ministry at mealtime. God designed us to eat three to seven times a day, depending on the portion sizes. And I've heard it's, eat, it's healthier to eat small portions more often than one great big meal. And I think we're designed that way because God is saying, come together, gather, gather around the table and eat and be in relationship with each other. And fa family table time is powerful. It's powerful and it's important. And we need to remember that and refocus our attention and reclaim this table. You know, pythons eat once a month. How would you like that if God made us to eat once a month? <laughs> I don't like that very much, man. I wake up in the morning and suddenly I'm craving eggs and bacon and toast and some days it's hash browns and other days it's whole strawberries. And if the blueberries are good, I'm going to go for them. Every once in a while I just want pancakes, although I have a pancake waist and I don't want to beat them too often. <laughs> So I'm being, being a good boy on occasion anyway. But it's, you know, it's, it's, you know pythons eat once a week, we, we, three to seven times a day we can eat. You know, some of you, 
You have to understand this. So I believe that eating together and sharing a table is important. We need to reclaim the table. Remember, hashtag NH table. Hashtag NH table. Take the picture with your family eating and post it on a social media place. And then you'll be entered into a drawing for a $100 Hy-Vee gift card that someone has donated so that we could give away. And now you can invite friends and say, hey, post your, fa pay your family too and, ha and hashtag it NH table because they don't have to come here to do it. They have to be here present to win. You don't win if you're not here but you invite your friends and, and it's a great way to do it. So listen, we're going to reclaim the table, hashtag NH table. The average American, you know, eats one of five of their meals in the car. One out of five meals they eat in the car. We need to slow down and reclaim the table. And studies show that if you eat three family meals together per week, you're setting up your children and your grandchildren for to win. The Vanderbilt University did a study about why some children excelled in reading and others didn't excel. They thought what determined the difference depended on whether or not the parents were reading to their children, which I'm sure has a little bit, but they found out that was not the primary reason the reading to your children wasn't actually correct. Actually, what they found out is it's based on if the families ate family dinners together, that's what propelled their ability to read. That's interesting, isn't it? If they had family meals together at least three times a week, then they were more likely to be very good readers. During those meals, the families were talking. The vocabulary of their children expanded. They were learning how to interact. They were learning how to form sentences. And they found out that eating meals together was way more important than reading stories, stories at night to your kids. It was all about family meals, spending time together. There's a man by the name of Leonard Sweet, and I recommend this book, you can write it down. The name of the book that he wrote is Tablet to Table, Tablet to Table. Leonard Sweet says this, he said that the Amish, you know, the Amish retain 95% of their children in the Amish lifestyle. Can you imagine that? In a day of technology that they have the success rate of 95% to retain them in their Amish lifestyle. That's credible to me. And they found out the key was that twice a day the family stops and they have a family meal together and they talk and they, they pray. Dad leads, they sing, uh, they praise a blessing on them, they tell stories of their past, they tell stories and they communicate and, and uh, it's a physical gathering together. And, and no matter where you go in this world, when you have that going on, technology is not going to take away the moment of being around the table with the family. Leonard Sweet, the author, also said the reason that Jewish people who make up 0.2% of our population of the world hold Nobel Peace Prizes, half of them, 50% of the Nobel Peace Prizes have been given to Jewish people. Why? Because of the family dinner. In the family, and Sweet points this out, the family dinner, the father tells them the story of the Bible. He tells them about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They eat together, they talk, they learn about the story of God. And instead of having to go out uh, when they're 18 years old and find themselves, they already know who they are. They already know where they are in the story and they don't have to go find themselves. You know, they can go out and be safe they already know who they are, and they can go out there and invent something, or they can go out there and be an entrepreneur and take a risk knowing that they have the safety of the family and that they're loved and who they are in God. There's something to it. It's amazing. Sweet said you can take the Old Testament and the New Testament, and you can put them in three sentences. Listen to this. Here's the Old Testament that summarized in a sentence. They're trying to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. Here's the New Testament. I love you. I forgive you. Let's eat. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if you open the door, I'll come in and I'll sit with you. I'll eat with you. I'll be there with you. That is what it's all about. That's why the sermon series of reclaiming the table is so important. So post your meal family photo in social media. Hashtag NH table. Hashtag NH table. Do it. Okay. It's a modern amen today on Instagram, Facebook. You say, I love my church, I love, and be positive about it. It's a way to point people toward a message of love and of hope so that you just do that. Hashtag NH table. Another thing I want us to do 
as a church besides take pictures and post. But I, I, I want us to, I want you to do this. I want you to pray at every single meal in no, November. I don't care where you are. I want you to pray. And none of this, like because you're with your boss or you're with a, a group, you know, you're with the CEO of your company or you're with this person who's, you know, foul and is going to like ridicule you because you do it. None of this under the table as you tie your shoe. Lord bless this. We're going to make it work. Nope. Not going to do that. Be creative. You don't have to get up and announce it. No, I'm going to pray for the meal. You know, no, just, just, you don't, just thank you for the meal. You know, under your breath, just pray. And if the server shows up right as you start to pray, it's just like, just what happened to me, not this week, but the week before. And I began, she caught us, and she was a little awkward moment. You ever had that happen that you don't know they're coming? You're, I said, oh, we're just about to pray. Is there anything I can pray for you about? She said, well, actually, there is. My niece, da 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 I came back in there the next day for breakfast. She said, guess what? I can't believe it. After you prayed, this is what happened to my niece. How about that? I'm so thankful because God does it. So, you know, you can blame it on me, right? When you get ready to pray, you just say, our pastor asks us to pray at every meal, so, so our church is all doing this. It's only for one month, and we're going to do it, okay? So please, if the, you know, just let me pray. It's the way it is. Just blame it on me. It's okay. And uh, so we're going to hashtag in each table, we're going to pray at every meal, and we're going to eat at least, not one, Pastor Austin, three family meals together every week for the, for the rest of our life, okay? So, so for the month of November, I know you're busy, but make it a priority. Your kids play sports, I know that. Tell that coach, our, our, uh, our uh, family coach, our family coach, our pastor, our pastor coach, who has more authority than you, our soccer coach, our basketball coach, our pastor coach, uh, he, because he wants us to go to heaven, he wants our kids to go to heaven, not just know how to kick a ball, shoot a ball, hit a ball, or throw a ball. Our pastor coach told us that we have to practice, and it's part of our training. And as soon as we're done with our pastor coach training, then we're going to come to our other practice, uh, and, uh, and, and, and when we're done with our church practice, we'll be at our sports practice. And as, as soon as we fulfill our obligations of our other coach, uh, the Weaver boy, uh, we'll be there for sports practice or dance or whatever else it is that we have to go that we think is more important than being together as a family and discipling our children because it's not. It's not more important. So we're going so to reclaim the table. We're going to do this. And uh, we're not, it's not a physical table, we're reclaiming the meal table, uh, meaning meaningful talking time around the table, around the dinner. So Jesus was with his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 20. You might get in your notes on that, that bulletin piece. Mark it down, Matthew 26, 20. It says, when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. Jesus was discipling them. Jesus Jesus is fully invested in discipling, and the family table is a place of discipleship. In Luke 10, Jesus is with Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, and discipling is happening. In Luke 11, he condemns a Pharisee at at a meal. He's there, and he takes time to say to his disciples, this is not what we should be doing. This is wrong. Here's what we should be doing. Jesus was always teaching, and he was always discipling around a meal. In Luke 19, he meets up with Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up into sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Along came Jesus walking by, and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house for a meal. You're going to feed me. And he went there, and we know later that Zacchaeus was converted. Jesus brought salvation, and he brought discipleship, and he ministered to Zacchaeus. Jesus was uh, always doing ministry with food. In Luke 19, uh, I mean, uh, parents and grandparents, leather, I already said the Luke 19, they're responsible before God to lead your children, your grandchildren, to disciple them, to bring them to Christ. And I, I want to just say, you hear what I'm saying? Meal time is a discipleship time. Single moms, you're supposed to be discipling at meal time. Families are supposed to be discipling around the table. Grandparents, if you're blessed enough to have your grandchildren around and your kids have a 
provide one meal a week, invite them all there. Y'all work it out, be there and disciple and tell your stories, tell your kids, tell your grandkids your story and uh, disciple them. Tell the miracles, tell when you came to Jesus, pass it on to your kids. Recently, I, I was thinking about this and I thought, you know, my grandkids are pretty little and you know, they're a handful. Like this week, uh, the marriage weekend, my wife's on that cruise, and I kept Austin and Elizabeth's kids. We got 17 month, uh, someone that'll be three in November is coming up real quick, and someone else is going to be five in December. And I'll tell you what, I didn't, I didn't do any discipling. I just kept them from killing each other and made them fat. <laughs> and it was impossible. I'm going to tell you, some of you moms, you're, hu you're superhuman heroes. My daughter-in-law, I'll tell you what, now if you're having trouble raising the kids or you need some suggestions, she's amazing, I'll tell you that right now. She's not just another pretty girl, she's smart as a whip, I'll tell you that right now. So, uh, but anyway, I, I was telling the story to Sam and, and, and to the kids and at the table here, uh, I don't remember when it was, maybe it was last Wednesday, but I, I can't remember, but I was telling the story and I told about when I invited Jesus into my heart and what happened, I told, painted the story. I told him the song I sang into my heart. My heart Lord Jesus, told him the whole story. When I finished, Sam says, I like that story, Grandpa. That's a lot better than the stories, the make-believe stories my dad tell me at bedtime. <laughs> True story. I have, just saying. See, mealtime and discipleship is important, and, but it didn't just start with Jesus. It's throughout the Bible as we read in Deuteronomy 6. It didn't. So we see that you teach it to them, you impress it upon them, you, t you show them and teach them the word. You, and there's another verse that goes along with this, which says, here little, there little, line upon line, precept upon precept, a little bit at a time. Mealtime is when you're sitting at home, you're having a meal. So talk and eat, tell your story more than once, and uh, your, your kids might be like, hey, I didn't know my dad was a drug dealer. What? My mom was in jail. You what? Tell how Jesus set you free, how he changed you. Do they, do they know how you became a banker? Do they know about you, st how you studied hard and how you worked hard? Do they know uh, your sacrifice? Do they know times you obeyed and God honored and times you disobeyed and struggled with that and it led to disaster? Do they know about your story of giving to missions? Mark Blady recently gave to BGMC. By the way, if you didn't know that about the goat story, that's our children's wing of missions giving right? And Mark gave a, a good size check in an auction, and, and later, you know, he tells this miraculous story of God confirming it. He needs to tell that to his grandkids. There was a time when this church, I was frustrated, had been in existence uh, nine years, and I was frustrated because our church had only given for the whole year like 40-something thousand dollars. And we had this, this offering for Ethiopia Bible College, and I remember God laying a number on my heart, and my wife confirmed it, and it was big, but saving for a car to give to this Bible college, because I saw it and was there, and I saw this revival that's incredible, and the need to train these saved people, to train them and raise up ministers to make the church indigenous and to spread the gospel throughout Ethiopia. And so I wrote, I wrote this check for $10,000. I was like scared. My gut was spinning. I, I, I was sweating bullets, but I did it. I obeyed. And that offering was, I, I have a, a foam, a foam like check up there. I, I think it was 67,000 something dollars, way more than we'd given in a year. And we had been saving and announcing that we wanted to, to pay off that building over there a year and a half from that moment and have a big offering that was going to be 100,000 plus to, to have a miracle offering to pay off that building. And this was in June, and we took the offering in October, our nine-year anniversary of the church. And by the following June, that building was paid for. We didn't even have to take a miracle offering. Because I want to tell you, God honors obedience in everything that we do, whether it's giving, serving, loving, speaking to someone. Whatever you do, God honors it. So tell those stories. Pass them on. Tell how you failed when you disobeyed. Tell what you did that was hard, even if it meant sacrifice, and teach your children. We have to step up and reclaim the table and disciple our families and be in relationship and conversation with our families. I don't disciple my kids, and I didn't do it. I did pretty good. But I, if I had a do right, I'd do way better. But I didn't do it because I was a pastor. It's because I was a dad, and I was a Christian, and my wife also the same. And we can do this. Single mom, listen to me. 
you can disciple your kids. I want you to hear this. Some of the best adults, most godly people I know have been raised by single moms. And grandparents, remember the power of a grandparent is not just to spoil your grandkids and send them home. It's also to be a part of discipling them, okay? Speak into their life. So notice our text again. First we'll see meal time as you sit at home and then we'll see through, I think it's verse seven. It says, when you lie down at bedtime. Bedtime's important. You pray with them, you share with them, you talk. Get them in their bed where you have 10 minutes to let them talk. When they lie down, they don't want to go to sleep. They'll start talking, listen. And let me, let me just give you some parenting advice. Usually when you're the tiredest, your kids need to talk, you better talk. I don't care how bad it hurts. I remember my wife laying there and sitting there and talking when she was so exhausted she could hardly stand it and listening. And she listens way better than me. She's a great listener. And so I, I will just say to you, bedtime is important. And what this is saying, we're discipling, we're impressing the law, the Word of God, to teach the fear of God, to teach obedience, that every command of God is from God. We're doing it throughout the day, not just mealtime, but at bedtime. And then point four is in the morning time, when you get up, first thing, remind them, right? I teach our fifth graders the way you grow consecrated. It's called sanctification or becoming more like God or holy. The way you do that is at night, you say, God, you lay your head down and say, God, remind me of anything I've done that displeased you or I disobeyed anything. Just bring it back to my memory. And then if you just step there and think about the day the Lord will remind you, and then you pray, God, forgive me for that, and tomorrow help me not do that. Well, in the morning when you wake up, then you, you bring that back up to God. Now say, God, it, you know, I don't want to fall into this again, so you help me. You'd help me not laugh at someone. You help me not curse. You help me not be mean to someone. You help me not bully somebody. You help me obey the teacher. You help me respect. You help me be a true friend. You help me. So it's the morning time, and you are there. You're praying with those kids before they go to, go to school, and you're there, and you, you drop like in one second, just a little by little, you just say, you know, following Jesus is more important than the food you eat. To follow Jesus, faith means following Jesus every day, daily. Faith isn't belief. It's following Jesus daily. Shema. That's it. Morning time, point five, is drive time. As you walk along the road, well, just let me tell you something. Walking with your kids, with your spouse, there's something about walking together. If you have a spouse, hold their hand and talk. That's powerful. But also the car time can be good, too. Leave the music off. And I would do that with Austin. He's told you about it about a three minute ride to school and I would drop something in his heart. Don't forget, never forget. Someone's gonna try to show you this. Someone's gonna try to get you to do this. Here's what you say. Here's how, be plan, have a plan ahead of time. Know what you're gonna say. If you have to say, I promised my dad I wouldn't do that and I'm not doing it. And they can call you a sister and say, well, blame that on my dad. All right, so drive time. We must disciple every day, every way we can. In the morning when we wake, when we drive our kids anywhere and everywhere, be intentional. When we eat together around the table, when we lie down, and we can do it. And listen, bringing your family to church on Sunday morning twice a month, and even adding, uh, sending them on Wednesday night to be taught, even sending them to Christian school, it will not cut it. You're going to lose your family, most of them. Our faith will not be transferred with that. These things matter, these things help, I'm all for them, but when we disciple and invest each day, morning, noon, and night, when we're intentional about discipling and training, then we win and they will win because this is obeying God's word, particularly the, this passage, Shuma, Shuma, Shuma. So here's the action points. Take a picture, get your cameras ready. You ready to take a picture of the screen? A minimum of three family meals a week. Disconnect so we can connect. No phones on, no TV on, no books at the table, no music unless it's so soft it's not drawing your attention away. You're doing nothing but looking and talking, and interacting and eating together. Pray at every meal the month of November. Pray, don't back down and disciple at mealtime, bedtime, morning time, and drive time. Take a photo. Will you bow your head with me? We decided to follow you, Jesus, and we're not going to turn back. We take up our cross daily to follow you. So I pray right now, Lord, you would help us to understand the importance 
of gathering around a table, of sharing a meal, and of discipleship, that this church would take seriously the challenge to reclaim the table. You've created us in a way to have family meals, to get together, and you're there. When we pray, then you show up. We stop to acknowledge you. And you've given us this opportunity to gather with our family. I pray, God, you would help us not waste it. It's so powerful that when mom and dad and their children and grandchildren, they get together and eat and have these teachable moments and discipleship's going on. I just pray, Jesus, help everybody determine today to make a point, no matter what they have to sacrifice, to reclaim the table. And I pray for boldness for everybody here over this church, that they would pray in the boardroom, in the consulting room, and with the client, to have boldness to say, do you mind if I pray this blessing over this food? I always like to give thanks for God to everything I have. I pray for boldness among our teenagers, and believe me that they'll have strength to pray at school and not be ashamed of the gospel. I know you're gonna do something big with this, this month, Lord, as we reclaim the table. In Jesus' name I pray to your glory, amen. Before we go, let's all stand together. I want to ask a question. Let's, all, let's everybody stand. Are you here and you feel guilt and shame? Please don't take off if you, if you, unless you just really have to. Are you here and you feel guilt and shame? Because the enemy, he won't ever let you get past mistakes of the past. And he'll point at you and you'll read scripture, this is what you're supposed to do, but you know you didn't do that, and you feel horrible, and you feel terrible, and you have shame and guilt, and the enemy is condemning you after Jesus has, has forgiven you. Don't insult Jesus and the blood of Jesus Christ and his provision on the cross by thinking that his blood wasn't powerful enough to cleanse your sin. In fact, the Bible says he not only cleanses your sin, but he removes the stain of the sin. I'm telling you, Jesus, will forgive you and make you whole. And he wants then to bring you close to him and walk with you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, I wanna get rid of that shame and guilt. I need Jesus right now to just, just impress upon me that I'm free from shame and guilt. Close your eyes to respect your neighbor, please. I don't care how young or old you are, how long you've walked with God. Hear me, please, everyone, close your eyes. Thank you, close your eyes, thank you. Respect your neighbor. Raise your hand if you say, that's me, I need I need to be free from guilt and shame. Yes, yes. I see a lot of hands. I want Jesus to free me from guilt and shame of the past. I'll tell you, Jesus has the power to forgive it, and he loves you. He is not going to hold your sin against you. He removes your sin, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west. He, he chooses to not remember. He talk, talks about throwing those sins in the sea of forgetfulness to not remember them against you ever again. And those of you that maybe you've never accepted Christ, you're not sure you're ready to heaven, with every head bowed and every eyes closed tight, you just slip up a hand right quick and say, I want to act, ask Jesus into my heart to, I want to start following Jesus every day. I want to be a Jesus follower. Would you just slip your hand up anywhere? I want to be a Jesus follower. Yes, I see anyone else. I see you. Anyone else want to? Yes, three. I want anybody else want to be a follower of Jesus every day. Quickly slip your hand up and back down. So here's what I want those people that did. I want you, if you don't mind, when you go out the center aisle to the right on this side over here, the opposite side of the piano, when you go out there, there's a desk called Fresh Start, and there'll be some people there, and I'll be there, and I want to give you a gift, and I want to offer you materials, a wonderful Bible and some other materials that help you know for sure that you have eternal life. And I want you to mean this in your heart and make this your prayer right now, Jesus, forgive my sin. And he said, if you ask, he will. That's what the Bible says. Forgive my sin. And Jesus, come into my heart and change me by your grace. Change me by your grace in my heart. Help me, Jesus, think the way you think, see things the way you see them, and feel about the world the way you feel about it. Give me your mercy, your grace, your love, and your kindness, and let me help you. Help me, Lord, I pray, follow you. If you mean that in your heart, then Jesus is going to forgive you and has granted eternal life to you if you truly mean that. He's right now wiping away every sin and making you fresh. And all of a sudden, all the stress and strain from all the guilt, the shame, and all the past sin is just gone. And this is the first day of the rest of your life as if you'd never sinned. You're clean, white as snow. 
white as snow. And there's no more sin in your life. Jesus has taken it and buried it to forget it and hold, never hold it against you again. And we thank you for it, Jesus. Amen. Father, let that be our resolve, but we need your help. That's our cry to follow after you. And we apply ourselves, God, and you come to help us. Lord, we give ourselves to you to follow you with all of our heart. To take up our cross and not say my will, but your will. And your will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To glorify you, Lord Jesus to minister and love this world. May we, God, reclaim the table. Talk of all your goodness, your gratefulness, and be grateful. Tell of the miracles. Tell of your word. Tell of your commands. And stress the importance of obedience. Shema. To hear and obey. To listen and obey. In Jesus' name.